Hello, stat students. Back with another overview of another unit here with uh, sampling distribution. So we just uh, this followed the normal distribution uh, overview. Uh, normal distribution, first of all, again referred to situations where the population was already normal, uh, ACT, SAT, IQs, and the like. Uh, sampling distributions are really a gateway for us for uh, scenarios where the population data is not normally distributed. Uh, and without sampling distributions, really a lot of what we work with in statistics would be, um, you know, in uh, a much different light because sampling distributions is really about the, the process of getting non-normal distributions uh, reshaped to be normal. Um, and we'll talk about how that process works here uh, in this overview. Uh, so first of all, just to understand a couple uh, terms that, that you see a little more often now, statistic. Um, a statistic is a value that describes a sample, as you can see here. Um, the statistics that we often see in, in the AP stats world are the X bar, S for a standard deviation, P hat for a sample proportion. Um, and then the corresponding parameters, which is the population measurement. Uh, so th for instance, the X bar is a sample mean, mu is a population mean. S is a sample standard deviation. Sigma is a population standard deviation, uh, and P hat is a sample proportion, whereas P is the population proportion. Again, these are all statistics. These are all parameters here. Now, sampling distribution, uh, by definition, as you can see there, um, a distribution of a statistic and the distribution of values taken by the statistic in all possible samples of the same size from the same population. So keep in mind, this is not something that, that you would necessarily do by hand, which is uh, we got to be thankful that there are statisticians before us who who uh, have determined the possibility that there are computers that are, where we could run this, um, these sampling distributions. So if you think about in our school, there's about 3,400 students. And if we wanted samples of size 30, say, um, that's millions upon millions of samples of size 30 uh, to create this sampling distribution. And uh, so again, we wouldn't create that, but what we can do is understand the statistics behind it, um, at least to a degree of understanding what we're accomplishing if we took a bunch of samples. So again, all possible samples, same size, same population here, um, and the distribution of all of those. Uh, so what, what we would do then um, to create a sampling distribution is you take this large number of samples from the same population, um, you calculate the p hat and the x bar. So for instance, Let's say that uh, I assigned my students the task of going around and asking 30 randomly selected students how tall they are. And then I asked my students to come back with the, uh, the mean height of those 30 students who they asked uh, and report that back to me. And then we'll, we'll create a histogram from that. So, for instance, the first student might come back and say the, the mean height of my 30 students rounded to 68 inches. The next student comes back and says mine was 67, another 68, then a 69, um, another 68. There maybe was even a 66 in there, or maybe a 70 in there. Um, and then another student came back with a 69, another student came back with a 67, and so on. And what happens here is what we're graphing now is not individual heights, but we're graphing a bunch of X bars. Okay, and these X bars, again, it, there's not necessarily... 30 unique students in each one of these because all possible samples means that students would be in a number of samples and could be with a number of um, you know different collections of students in their samples so there might be overlap um, one particular student might be in three of these samples that I've that I've shown here of the nine I think that I've included here um, it doesn't matter because they're all randomly sampled and they're all of the same size I said 30 in this case from the same population, which in this case was the 3,400 students in our school. And, and we just graph these X bars. Now, what you'll notice here is the shape that I've started to build with these X bars, okay? Um, and you can see that this is looking symmetric and it's looking normal. Of course, I did that intentionally here, but that is what happens in the long run, um, whether it's X bars or P hats that we're including. And it doesn't really matter what the original distribution looked like. Okay, this could have been heights in our building. Um, perhaps they are a little skewed left if our younger students are not fully grown um, 
height wise yet. And so there might be some of that, but, but what happens here is we, we reach a point where we are, uh, um, we have the background to know that we can get to a normally distributed sampling distribution, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, a couple other items to note with a sampling distribution. First of all, biased versus unbiased. Uh, essentially, what this is referring to is the idea of, are we taking a random sample um, to ensure that our sampling distribution is unbiased? And what that really means is that the mu of our X bars, or the mean of our sample means, should equal the population mean. Um, so if I were to take all of my X bars here and put them into a list of 66, 67, 67, 68, 68, 68, 69, 69, and 70, if I were to put those into a list, the average of my samples, and again, this is the mu suggests every sample, all possible samples as we saw up top, um, has to be the same as the population mean. Okay, that is the notion of being unbiased. Okay, similarly, mu of the p hats is equal to p and you'll see these on your formula sheet that uh, that the idea of unbiased is shown in the sampling distribution section and that is just again that the mean of all your samples are going to equal your population mean uh, secondly variability variability has to do with the spread and the spread is dependent on the sample size so higher uh, n equals lower variability Okay, so if we were to take, instead of samples of size 30 in the example I was talking about with heights, if I were instead to take samples of size 100, I probably wouldn't get a 66 or a 70. Okay, I would probably be limited now to the 67, 68, 69. Uh, on the other hand, if I were to take samples of size 2, and I happen to get somebody who's 6'6 six, six in that sample with somebody who's 6 feet tall, now all of a sudden my mean is 75 inches tall. And uh, we would end up with, with means much more spread out um, because we simply, by, by increasing the sample size, what we're doing is essentially um, if we get an outlying value, it's getting more watered down because there's going to be more people in there whose heights are not outlying values. And so they just ultimately become a bigger factor in the overall mean. Whereas if our sample size is two, naturally, if you get somebody who's six six. Uh, the only way you can really water that down is if you get somebody who's really on the shorter side to end up with a mean back in that 5758 area. Uh, so variability is related to sample size um, and bias is related to uh, to having a random sample. And ultimately you think of it in kind of this bullseye approach that what you really want is if the center of this is mu or P, whatever it happens to be, you want your samples to be right around that bullseye. Okay, that would be a situation where this is low bias, low variability versus something where they all end up out here. That would be high bias, low variability. So that might be big samples, but your samples aren't random. So you went to, in this case, you went to basketball practice and, and randomly picked basketball players to be in your sample. Um, so it's obviously there's some bias in there. Um, the other situation is if you are random, but you... Uh, your sample is really small, then you're going to end up you're going to end up with points by the middle, but they're going to be all over the place. Okay, so again, what you want is a bunch of bullseyes or near bullseyes, like the original one that I drew right in there. Okay. Now, in terms of shape, the central limit theorem is perhaps the most important item that we have in the AP statistics world. Where the central limit theorem, um, again, theorem been proven, so. Uh, as you see here, the sampling distribution of the means or, um, or proportions from any population whatsoever will be normal, provided that the sample size of the individual samples is large enough. And what that is for us is, is when it's means, typically we're looking at n being 30 or more. Okay, when it's proportions, we're looking at n times p and n times 1 minus p, which means the number of successes um, and the number of fails would be 10 or more. And what happens then is you can see this progression down here, this progression of showing four different distributions, one that's normal, and you can see it's normal with higher variability. And then as the sample size gets bigger, it's still normal, but the variability has gone down. Um, the second one here where we see the skewed distribution, um, you can see when the sample size was three, it was still skewed, but starting to be fixed, if you will. And then as the sample size went to five, it's still a little skewed, 
but it's getting better and better. And as the sample size increases, it's getting better and better. And by the time it's 20, it looks like we've maybe fixed it. Um, either way, we know that by the time we get to 30, that we are going to, uh, and by fixed it, I, I mean it's normal now. Um, by the time we get to 30, we know the sampling distribution will be normal. And again, we aren't graphing now individuals, we are graphing means of that size. So means in this bottom row, this is means of groups of 20. So those are a bunch of X bars or P hats for groups of 20. And you can see here that 20 seems to have about done the trick to get these sampling distributions to be normal for all of these, um, which is, it, it can happen. Um, it, it's, sometimes two is the magic number. Here we saw one, when the sample size is one, this was already normal because the population was normal. Um, but every distribution has a kind of a different magic number, but we know that 30 or more works for all of them through the central limit theorem. Um, and in, in certain cases, it might be close to normal already, the population, so it's two or three. In other cases, it might be really ugly the po uh, in terms of apparent population and its shape. And so you might need to have bigger samples in order to to get that distribution to be normal. Um, and you can kind of see that in this graphic, um, how different sample sizes seem to, to get us closer to normal in, in some distributions versus others. Uh, couple last things here. Uh, in terms of the, the, um, the means versus the proportions, these are some things on your formula sheet as well, but here's the mean and standard deviation uh, formulas for the sampling distribution of sample means. So as you can see, this first one, mu of the x bar is equaling mu, that's that idea of unbiased, and that will always be the same. So in other words, if the mean height of all 3,400 students in our school is 68 inches, then the mean of all of our samples will be 68 inches. And if the mean income in our district, even though it's very skewed to the right, if the mean income in our district is uh, $200,000, then the mean of our samples will be $200,000. Now in the spread or the variability down here, this is where it changes a little bit because as we noted on the last page, or as I noted on the last page, that as the sample size increases, the variability goes down. That means as this n increases, we, do ex we would expect the spread to be less. Okay, so what starts out as something that's very spread out, maybe a little skewed to the right, is over time, as we increase that sample size, not only is it getting more normal, but it's getting less spread out. And so it's kind of going to what's going to happen is we're going to kind of end up going like this, where that mean, um, the mean might have been here the whole time, okay, even on the blue curve, the mean was right there, just because it was skewed to the right. So the mean didn't change, and that's what we saw in that first formula, but the spread did because now all of a sudden these values out here were in sampling, in samples with other values and bigger samples, and so that spread decreased as a result. Um, so that's the that's the notion there of as n gets bigger, variability goes down or the spread goes down. Um, notice that these are sigmas. Okay, these are parameters. Um, this would, there'd have to be something given to you in a question to get that sigma for you. Okay, again, if you get a list of numbers, you are finding s. You are not finding sigma. So sigma would be a value that's typically given to you in a problem. Um, now this does have a couple requirements. Again, these do need to be simple random samples. And in order to ensure normality um, across all possible parent populations, we do need n to be 30 or more. Um, on the proportion side, very similar. Okay, if we have 30% uh, of students in our school who agree with some statement, then if we ask 30 or 50 students at a time, the average of those, um, all those p hats will also be 30. Okay, so this is again the, the idea of being unbiased. Uh, whatever our population proportion is, the mean of all of our samples will also be that same percentage. Um, again, this is for 3,400 at a time, and this might be for 50 at a time, but 100 samples of 50. Okay, 100 samples of 50, and those 100 samples of 50 have an average p hat of 30% still. Uh, finally, the spread, and again, another sigma here. 
So in this case, you would have to be given in a question like a P and an N, and then you would be finding the sigma, or you could be given the sigma of the P hats, and you'd be finding the N or some other um, element of, of the algebra there. Um, but this would be the spread, and again, these are on your formula sheet. This is the spread for a sampling distribution, and again, the root N is in the denominator, and that root N, again, is a showing that our as our sample size increases, our variability uh, decreases. And just to note, because these are both root ends, if you want to cut your sigma in half, okay, to cut sigma in half, you would need to quadruple your sample size, okay? And that's because that n is in a uh, is a denominator under a radical. So, um, so just a heads up on that. That if I wanted to, if my spread um, was or if my margin of error. We shouldn't say margin of error. Just if our if our standard deviation was five percent, and I wanted to cut it to two and a half percent, then I'd have to quadruple our sample size. Um, margin of error we'll get into later when we bring in confidence intervals. Uh, finally, the requirements for this: we do need simple random samples, and we do need the n times p and n times one minus p to be ten or more. And finally, one last note about how sampling distributions show up on the AP exam. Um, very commonly what will happen is you'll be given information, um, like for instance, on the mean side, you'd probably be given a mu and a sigma. On the proportion side, you'd be given a P and an N, um, and an N on the mean as well. Uh, and the part A would be describe the sampling distribution. And when it asks you to describe the sampling distribution, what it's really asking for is center, spread, and shape, okay? And center and spread would be your mu and your sigma. Okay, so that would just be using the proper notation, and that's why it's on the formula sheet. Make sure you use the proper notation here, whether it's means or proportions, and you would fill in the values. Um, and again, you'd copy that. You would write mu of the x bars or mu of the p hats, and then you'd put the values in. Sigma of the x bars, sigma of the p hats, you'd put the values in. That would be your center and spread res respectively. And then provided that n is 30 or more, if it's a mean, or that n times p and n times 1 minus p are 10 or more if it's proportion, then you could say it's approximately normal, which in most cases it will be. They'll, they'll make sure to follow those rules. And part of the reason they want to make sure that we get it to be normal is a fo common follow-up question would be an actual probability question regarding the sampling distribution. For instance, uh, what's the probability that in a sample of 30 students, their average height is greater than 68 inches? And so then you would get into a z-score where it's x bar minus mu divided by sigma over root n. Okay, again, if you recall last, on the normal distribution, it was simply x minus mu divided by sigma, and that's because n was one. Okay, so really this was kind of a root one there, and we didn't need an x bar because it wasn't an average, it was just a single value. So that was last unit, now it's the sampling distribution, um, and it's an x bar, and we have the, the root n. Or on the proportion side, we'd have z equals p hat minus p divided by p times 1 minus p over n, which again is just statistic minus parameter divided by the standard deviation in both cases. Um, once you get the z-score, then you're along those normal CDF routes again to get your calculation of a, of a final probability. Um, but that's a common sort of question that you get from sampling distributions. Um, and again, you would be given some information, a telltale sign is you're given a sigma um, on the mean side versus what you'll be seeing in the future where you might have to use an S um, and you'd be given a P and then you'd be asked a question that would be about the P hat. Um, hope you find that helpful. If you have any questions, as always, please ask and we'll see you next time. Thank you.